<laughs> oh, yeah. All will become clear. <laughs> in that nice amphitheater, just yeah. plopped right in there. <laughs> well, as you can see, I've been traveling again. Uh, and uh, they call this N Namibia's, uh, can you, is it okay? Okay, okay. Namibia's fallen star, great big meteorite out in the middle of nowhere. So I've been traveling. I started in Windhoek, right here, went down near, saw the dunes all up and around here, and ended up in Victoria Falls. But where we're going to talk about is Groot Fontaine, which is where the Hoba meteorite is, about 20 kil kilometers west of Groot Fontaine. So you've seen one picture of it. We'll get to some more after a bit. There's a nice um, national monument there that, that was uh, established in 1955, uh, but they didn't get built until close to 1990. The landowner donated the meteorite and the land to Namibia, and a uranium company donated the funds for development of the site, including that nice amphitheater that you saw in that first picture. So this is what greets you. Better not have any complaints, it's 300 miles. <laughs> and they don't have Wi-Fi, so they have to talk to each other. That's a big problem anymore, you know. <clears throat> also, beware of falling meteorites, especially <laughs> that one. <clears throat> OK, so we all know what some of these things are. The asteroid is just going to pass by Earth. If it burns up, it's a meteor. If it hits the ground, it's a meteorite. It just stays there, it's Congress, right? called Congress. Or maybe Parliament. <laughs> okay, now this is this is uh, not to show that I was there, not proof of purchase or anything <laughs> like that. You see, it's just for uh, to show how big the meteorite really is. Um, okay, here's some st statistics on this thing. Discovered in 1920, it's about three by three by one meters, weighs 61,000 kilograms. Age is you know four. 527 plus or minus 29 million years, and that was uh, uh, estimated in 1996, fairly recently they came up with that site. It's a nickel-rich group 4B attack site. There's only about 14 of these meteorites of this age that are known to exist, and this is one of them. So it's 82% iron, 16% nickel, and around 1% other elements, mostly cobalt. cobalt. And that, that provides something interesting later on. Um, the Smithsonian Institute scientists concluded that the meteorite had been present, quote unquote, on the surface of the Earth for about 80 to 300,000 years. And that a layer about 27 inches thick was removed from the meteorite by ablation when it passed through the atmosphere. And uh, that comes from Fernie. Somebody might recognize that name here, but we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> Things of note, uh, Hoba from the native language means gift. It's the largest known single piece meteorite in the world. It's the most massive naturally occurring piece of iron known on Earth's surface. Not surrounded by a crater. It's remarkable flatness of its bounding surfaces, unique among meteorites. One theory is that the meteorite shape caused it to skip along the surface of the Earth rather than crashing and burying itself. I guess like skipping a rock across water, but uh, that's a pretty heavy one. Um, so there it is. I uh, just walked around it. It looks pretty much the same all the way around, starting here at the, whoops, sorry. Starting here at the steps. This is just side one, side two, side three, side four. It's all pretty uniform. Um, so some analysis was done on it right away uh, after discovery by a non-scientist, but he was uh, very detail-oriented. Um, and they found elongated patches of troilite, which is a rare iron sulfide, uh, most common uh, mineral on the lunar surface is troilite. And it's also present uh, uh, in Martian meteorites. Um, these whitman staten lines that are very often present in meteorites of this type are absent in this one. But there are some Newman lines that are present. Uh, these are just example photos. They're not from Hoba. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, vandalism used to be a problem, but it's very hard to do because of the composition of the meteorite. Why? A nickel iron mass with just a touch of cobalt results in an alloy, alloy of unexpected toughness, you know, even if it is fairly ductile. Um, so those, those are examples, up close examples, of where vandals have tried to get a piece of this meteorite. Somebody asked me if I brought home a piece of it. No way. You're not getting, not getting anything off of that. Um, there's an interesting story here. Uh, the South African company uh, donated to the British Museum a piece of this meteorite. But getting it off the meteorite was uh, a real chore. Um, it took two days for two natives working all the time with many hacksaw blades to get off a wedge-shaped piece about 2,500 grams and about the size of a sheet of paper, very, fairly small sheet of paper. Uh, and this is from uh, Spencer from the British Museum, who then performed a thorough analysis of the specimen. The meteorite has unfortunately been disfigured all along one top edge by some stupid person with an oxyacetylene blowpipe. So it's tough getting a sample of that meteorite. Um, they only, only seem to be 18 pieces of this in collections around the world, only totals 25 kilograms out of 61,000. So it's hard to get at. Okay, here's a, little, here's a little bit of the history. And this disagrees with what you find on um, uh, Wikipedia. But this is, the, the, this is an actual uh, uh, tale that the man who found it told, and it's in the museum in Grootfontein. He was, uh, uh, Wikipedia says that uh, somebody was out plowing and they, they hit it with their plow and, and found it. He was out hunting. He saw, noticed the strange rock, sat down on it, tried to scrape a little bit, a little bit of silver under there. So he thought he, he got just enough off that he took in to Grunfontein, where um, a, meteorolo a mineralogist established it to be a meteorite. So he came home, and they talked about it. And he went on with his work, and Mrs. Britz started excavating it. So she, she started digging and got quite a ways around digging it. So they weren't the owners of the farm where this was found. The, uh, Hansen was. Uh, and after he heard about the discovery, he now claimed to be the discoverer. Um, so he wrote to the museum saying, I have discovered on my farm a huge meteorite, and I have digged a trench around it to find its thickness. So he wanted somebody to put a value on it. The museum replied in a rather condescending tone, one cannot quote a price as one can for sheep or cattle. Okay, these are just some kind of random photos. This is thought to be the first photo of the, of the meteorite. Uh, no date on that. Once the knowledge about this meteorite spread around the area, it got other people coming just to take a look at it. This man here is Spencer, who was very involved in analysis of this. Now, this is the uh, International Geological Congress excursion in 1929 to see it. And this is Gordon, who did the analysis on, that I've already talked about. He was the second ever sci scientist to visit the meteorite in 1929. So even the New York Times gets in on this in 1929. Um, uh, and particularly here, again, chance has led us to the discovery of one of those mysterious messengers that come to the Earth bearing evidence that space is not empty, but is populated with a vast multitude of small fragments. So this was in 1929. So now, who knows this man? Does anybody know for me? I thought, Ralph, anybody else? Yeah, I figured Ralph would know. OK, I just kind of came across this. He was a Canadian astronomer based at the DDO who had been in Cape Town during the mid-'50s. Well, he went back in 1966, and he and a friend um, drove by car, not four by fours. And even today, on my trip, those roads are rough. You know, there aren't that many paved roads. They're rough roads. So that must have been quite the trip. Um, and he published this uh, article in the uh, Rask Journal, 1967. 
I didn't find this article until about two days ago. I was going to ask you if you knew how to get a hold of it, Tom. But I did finally came across it, and I haven't had time to read the whole thing. It's very interesting. Um, he took what was considered to be the first color photograph of the meteorite and said that among the major meteorites known on Earth, few can have received less attention than the Hoba meteorite. And that's probably true, because this was in 1976, discovered in 1920, a long time in between there. They established the, the, the site in 1955, so it took a long time for people to come to the party on this meteorite. So he was president of RASC from 74 to 76. Uh, so, oh, I had to uh, consult a thesaurus for, for making this presentation, but he was no help at all. <laughs> often at a loss for words. <laughs> okay, so these are a little off subject, but sort of close. There's only two touristy photos, Paul, so. <laughs> um, this is in Swakopmund, it's on the Atlantic coast, and this is the world's largest quartz crystal cluster on display. I thought it was pretty interesting. 14,000 kilograms, 520 million years old. This is, oops, sorry. This is my photo here. This is, I stole off the website because it gives a comparison of the size. It's, a, it's big. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to just come up and look up at this thing. Um, okay, people have asked me since I came back if I did any observing while I was there. Well, kind of, sort of, one night, sort of. This is the, my um, place where I was staying at night. It's on the banks of the Quando River. You can see the river out there. Right in front of the hut, there's a deck there. But I walked out after dinner one night about 9 o'clock and was coming back to my, to my lodge. And this path here is patrolled at night by a guard, back and forth, back and forth because there are no fences and there's wildlife around. And we had just been watching crocodiles and elephants and hippos across the river there. So I thought, I looked up and I thought, oh, this sky is glorious. I have to just find some place to look up at it. But there, there are lights on the path. But I found this little corner right here on my, on my deck where this tree blocked the light. So I took a chair out there and I sat there for about a half an hour looking up. Not a good side. I'm facing east there. There's not really, you know, Mars is up here. You know, planets are over here. <clears throat> uh, until, about a half an hour I'm there, until all of a sudden I hear a splash and some rustling in the bushes. <laughs> I was back in that lodge in about five seconds, li <laughs> leaving the chair. So that's my observing in Namibia experience. <laughs> so just a few touristy phones, ph photos. These are, this was on an airplane flight over the coast land near Swakopmund, and those dunes look like that. They look just luscious. It looks like frosting. They're just gorgeous. Okay, here's a, so here's a moon. It's a moon set uh, over Etosha National Park. Uh, that one's taken with an iPhone, because my, my camera lens went out on me halfway through this trip, my, my um, wide-angle lens. Uh, there's my pelican sunset. I told you, the thousands of pelicans we saw there. Thousands of pelicans. And there's my hippo sunset. So the sunsets are kind of relevant to astronomy here. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so I did some digging around too to prepare this presentation, but not quite like Mrs. Britz was doing. Not, quite, not, quite, not digging in the dirt too much. This I've been told is an African goodbye. That's all, folks. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> so, any questions? No, nope. Adrian. I don't have your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got to go to the coolest places on Earth. Yeah, I'm old. I've saved my money. <laughs> well, what uh, was your reasoning behind uh, going to this group? Because normally you do Astro first, actually. Right. No, I, I, for a long time, I've wanted to go to uh, uh, 
other, I've been to Morocco and Tunisia and Gabon. I've always wanted to go south in Africa, and particularly Namibia. It's just always been one of those dreams to do. And this trip came up that took me exactly where I wanted to go. You know, I saw everything I wanted to see, you know, in uh, four weeks, you know. Had a fabulous time. You know, mainly animals and pretty scenery, you know, few stars. So, anything, anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.